And now we'll have the gathering hymn, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. as Christy and Heather have us call to worship. Welcome to the community of faith, the family of God. We come as families, large and small in number, seeking God's love. God's love is here for you. Help us to understand how we are connected to God. We abide in Christ Jesus in love and compassion. May our spirits be renewed and our connection in God be strengthened through our worship today. Amen. And now, it's children's time with Chuck and Buddy. Well, Buddy, it's Mother's Day morning. What was that? Okay, Buddy wanted to send a great big hug to all the moms out there since he can't physically do it because he figures every mom needs a hug. What? Oh, especially after putting up with people like me and Chris. Did I get that dirty look, Buddy? No. Yep. <laughs> but, but when Chris told me that he was going to do his message on about being a, being a Christian, I thought, what? better example of being a Christian than is that of a mom. I know when I was a little kid who, even though I tell about I was a little angel, we all know that's not true. My mom would always find a way to forgive me and always seem to teach me that when I misbehaved, it turned into something good. Granted, for a while there, her favorite thing was making me scrub the toilet, and I think we had to clean the toilets in the city of Washington at the time for a while. And then when my boys were little, they got in some trouble. And their mom went so away above and beyond, kept trying to do the right thing. And now that they're older, they understand what she did. And I got the more I got to thinking, buddy, is that you don't have to be necessarily a mom to be a mom, like Chris said. I know a couple of kids who have a couple of special aunts in their lives that one set, who's in high school, their aunt took a day off from work to go to a music event all day with them at school. I know another set of kids whose their aunt takes the nephew to piano practice every week. And the aunts could not love the kids any more than if they were their own mom. And that takes a special person to do that. I know I've got a couple aunts like that that, that they even... Call me. They give me the when the whole COVID thing started. My one aunt kept telling me about getting the shot until I finally got vaccinated, and then she was happy. But you know, it's stuff like that. It's a love like that that we that proves that about being Christian. So, and you have it takes being Christian is more than just coming to church every Sunday and doing what I call fake Christians, where they sit in church every Sunday and then they don't do anything good the rest of the week. Moms do good 
seven days a week, every day of the year. If it's something little as making sure the kids have their lunches for next in the morning for school or getting their homework around or how many times has there been you moms had to run to school because the kids forgot something give you the call mom we forgot this important project and we need you to come can you bring it to us i don't think there's very many moms that haven't gotten that phone call so on this mother's day buddy let's first of all enjoy the beautiful day and hope that all the moms out there had to have the day they deserve and second, let's take time to remember that being a Christian is something very special. Are you ready to do a quick prayer before we hear Chris's message? Yes, I know. It's, you have to listen to Chris today. I know, buddy. All right. Dear God, we thank you for the moms in our lives. We also thank you for the women who, like Chris said, may not be moms, in this one sense, but her moms in the other sense. And we ask you to continue to help us show them the love that they they deserve and to make this day extra special for them. Amen. Today's scripture readings reading is from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 11 through 18. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way through great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labor, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors, and yet are true, as unknown, as yet as well-known, as dying and see, we are alive, as punished, and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and possess everything. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children. Open wide your hearts also. Do not be mismatched with unbelievers. For what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship is there between light and darkness? What agreement does Christ have with Beliar? Or what does a believer share with an unbeliever? Unbeliever. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from them and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch nothing unclean. Then I will welcome you, and I will be your father and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. The word of God for the people of God. And now we are going to be treated to special music with a vocal solo by Christy. And 
And no one ever paid the rent. And no one hardly ever went very far from home for. No love, first of all, a wife gave her baby's breath and life. The greatest joy to feed the clan, Thanksgiving turkey, Christmas ham, smoking luckies, scrubbing pans. The smell of bleach on grandma's hands. Her age all choked up in her throat for twenty years. She barely spoke. Now. Nola's daughter was my mom. She took the load and carried on. She gave me life and prayed that I might someday lay it down and fly. These women made a place for me. With blood and sweat, they set me free to sing my life and own it too, just as your mothers did for you. We must remember, not forget. What Noah's life really meant, although she never earned a cent, she paid her life for me. Wow. No piano accompaniment. Truly a solo. Wasn't expecting that. That was gorgeous. So I stand before you here today, humbly, as a lay speaker in the United Methodist Church. We don't get called to speak often. And I've raised this point before, but I'm going to bring it up again because I feel how important it is for you to understand. I've had six weeks that I've known that Jamie was going to be gone. And I didn't know what my message was going to be. I'm not going by the lectionary. I had that luxury of time to prepare for it. Now, having said that, I didn't write this until yesterday. But imagine, if you will, as a pastor, having to prepare a message every week. Week after week after week after week. And in that message, what you're trying to do, yes, inform sometimes, but you're always hoping, praying, that you'll be able to at least touch one soul with your words. And as Carol would say, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, I hope that the words that come out of my mouth today are from him, through me, not from me. And as I said, I had six weeks to prepare for this. And I didn't, I just didn't know. But something kept coming back to me again and again and again and again. It's like, okay, I hear you. 
got to pay attention sometimes, right? What got me started on this was a, a, a poem that I'd read, oh, I guess it was probably about a month ago that I read this, and it's from Carol Wimmer, written in 1988. It's entitled, When I Say I Am a Christian. Here it is. When I say I am a Christian, <clears throat> I'm not shouting, I've been saved. I'm whispering, I get lost. That's why I choose this way. When I say I am a Christian, I don't speak with human pride. I am confessing that I stumble, needing God to be my guide. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not trying to be strong. I'm professing that I am weak and pray for strength to carry on. When I say I'm a Christian, I'm not bragging of success. I'm admitting that I've failed and cannot ever pay the debt. When I say I am a Christian, I don't think I know it all. I submit to my confusion, asking humbly to be taught. When I say I'm a Christian, I'm not claiming to be perfect. My flaws are far too visible, but God believes I'm worth it. When I say I'm a Christian, I still feel the sting of pain. I have my share of heartache, which is why I seek his name. When I say I am a Christian, I do not wish to judge. I have no authority. I only know that I am loved. And that's what stuck with me. Am I a Christian? You notice how I phrased that. I wrote, I am, am I, I am a Christian. Am I a Christian? I've never doubted my faith. I've not always been a churchgoer until I hit the United Methodist Church 10 years ago, I think, when I must profess to you, I first felt for the first time in my life I was hearing the word of God. What it means to be a Christian, at least according to to culture, it, that has changed over the years. People think that going to church occasionally or simply believing in God makes them a Christian. But the Bible presents a different perspective and definition of a Christian. A Christian is someone whose behavior and heart reflects Jesus Christ. Followers of Jesus were first called Christian in Antioch. Acts 11 verse 26 says, for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. They were called Christians because their speech and their behavior reflected Jesus Christ. So what does it mean to be like Jesus Christ? As a Christian, someone who has put faith and trust in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ through his death on the cross and subsequent resurrection, our behavior mirrors, reflects, and resembles Christ. Being gracious and merciful to others is behaving like Christ. Forgiving, loving, and praying for our enemies is Christ-like. Welcoming and serving the marginalized, the least among us, is being like Jesus. Caring for the sick, the needy, the underprivileged, the widowed, the orphaned, the poor, the abused, the vulnerable, those who are last, mirrors and reflects the Son of Man. Striving for justice reflects Jesus. It's not simply good works that make someone a Christian. Being a follower and disciple of Jesus extends beyond our outward behavior. It includes the condition of our heart. Years ago at Trinity, we had our sessions called Tuesday Night Out. And we watched a video series called Not a Fan, uh, put out by Pastor Kyle Heidelman, who's a uh, best-selling author and teaching pastor at the Southeastern Christian Church in Louisville. It's uh, one of the largest churches in America. He said, being a fan of Christ, not a follower of Christ, is like saying you're a Christian because you go to church. <laughs> Sorry, kids, that's not enough. One of the two phrases 
of the many that I learned from Pastor Bob Bowles at the Trinity United Methodist Church was, um, so, you know, going to church doesn't make you a Christian. He called that churchianity. And the ones who attend church on Christmas and Easter, he called priesters. Certain things stick with you. So what does it mean to have a Christian heart? When we put our faith and trust in Christ, we commit our lives to serving him and serving others as he has served us. Our behavior and mindset reflects the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Christ is in us and with us. We are new creations. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. Our old way of thinking is gone. Our motivation, our desire, and our purpose are replaced with delight in the things of God. The joys and pleasures of our lives are exponentially enhanced through our relationship with Christ. And our selfish and worldly pursuits are exchanged for our desire to honor God. Life in Christ is not a life of, I don't get to do what I like. It's not a life of loss. Instead, it's a life of abundance, where what I used to like and desire pales in comparison to what my heart now desires. Christians see, feel, and experience the world in a different way, a much grander deeper, and meaningful way. One of the new ways we see the world is through the lens of others first. For example, Christians are called to love the orphan and widow and care for those less fortunate. God's concern for the vulnerable or the marginalized is apparent in his command for us to defend them. James chapter 1, verse 27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. A Christian heart living out Christian values resembles intangible care and compassion for others. It is characterized by our active love of others. That is the meaning of compassion. In John 13, verse 34, 35, Jesus said, Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. How do you know you're a Christian? One of my favorite hymns, besides the ones that opened the worship service today, is they will know, and you've heard me speak these words up here before, but I'm going to do the whole lyrics for, they will know we are Christians by our love. We are one in spirit, we are one in the Lord. We are one in spirit, we are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity one day will be restored. And they will know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they will know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news that God is in our land. We will work with each other. We will work side by side. We will work with each other. We will work side by side. And we'll guard each man's dignity and save each man's pride. All praise to the Father from whom all things come, and all praise to Christ Jesus, his only Son, and all praise to the Spirit who makes us one. So, do you love? Do you show that love? I remember distinctly a conversation that, and this has been 30 years ago probably, that a friend of mine had with my business partner at the time. And you guys know me. You know I'm not what I call a Bible thumper. Um, I just, 
I don't try to beat you over the head with the Bible, okay? Um, I just try to lead a loving life. Now, I never mentioned my faith to my partner. And please understand that my business partner was um, kindly, I'll call him cynical and sarcastic sort. Someone would walk in the store, he'd say, what do you want? What a great customer attitude. Um, so my friend asked him, do you see how people are drawn to Chris? Do you see how he smiles at them? Did you know he's a Christian? My partner seemed surprised, and he responded to Trent, but he doesn't talk about it. My friend says he doesn't have to. He just shows it. Honestly, I'd never thought of it that way before, and I thank my friend Trent for pointing that out to me. What exactly is a Christian? The short answer is a Christian is someone who is in a relationship with, because, with, with God because of their attitude to Jesus. The two important things to realize is that it is about relationship with God and that is available only through Jesus. Let me explain. God, as the creator of the world, has made us, humanity, to have a relationship with him. It is built in need we have and we find fulfillment in it. Through such a relationship, God pours out his blessings and gives us all that we need. Yet our desire for independence has meant that we have turned our back on God. Now, that's what sin is all about. Some of us do this actively by denying his existence or denying his right to demand our allegiance. But many of us, we just do this passively by ignoring him. Because of this, God is angry with us. Our relationship with him has been fractured. It's very similar to the way a, a marriage relationship is fractured when a husband walks out on his wife or the wife walks out on the husband. While God is angry with us, his love for us compels him to do something about it. So through his son, Jesus Christ, he reconciles us to himself, repairing that relationship and offering opportunity for us to come back to him. So now God promises forgiveness and restore the relationship with him to any who turn back to him and trust or put their faith in his son, Jesus. A Christian, therefore, is someone who recognizes that they have turned their back on God, recognizes that out of their love out of his love for us, God has reconciled us to himself through the death of his son and turns back to God and believes God's promise of forgiveness, putting their trust in Jesus Christ and his death on their behalf. How do you know if you were a Christian? If you recognize that. You've turned your back on God and believe in therefore trust put your faith in God's promise to save you through Jesus, then you are a Christian and in a restored relationship with God. It is that simple. The way to express that trust is to work hard to live as God wants you to. It stands to reason if ignoring God led to a fractured relationship with him, then having a relationship restored means paying attention to him. This means listening to him by reading the Bible. It means talking to him in prayer. It means obeying him as your God. And it means meeting with other Christians. There are outward signs of this renewed relationship. Finally, I want to encourage you to remember that a Christian is not perfect. So while we try to live as God wants us to, we do fail, I profess to that. In such cases, we need to remember that God died to pay the penalty for that failure. So when you fall, get up, admit your sin, and give thanks to God for what Jesus has done for you. Look at what Jesus has done rather than what you have done because 
his actions, not yours, are the actions by which God has saved you. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Oh, gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the relationship we have with you. We ask for your courage as we go through these trying times. We ask you to guide us, to show your love to others, to not hide it. Don't keep that light under a bushel. Let it shine outwards and make us messengers of your peace. And now, as you have taught us, please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, join uh, in our closing hymn. Well, you, you guys aren't going to sing, but Heather and Chris, you're going to sing our closing hymn. And then right after that, Betty will play the postlude. I'll follow that up with a benediction, and we'll close with a threefold amen. Friends and beloved of Christ, you have been chosen to go into this world with the message of God's love. Bear fruit of hope and joy, peace and justice with all that you meet. May God's peace be with you all.
Now go out. Love. Have a great day.